Yeah, I'm good. All right, so hopefully everybody got a chance to uh, read through the chapter and has a lot of questions to ask. I actually, when I went through it, ended up making a, one or two suggestions to, to Hadley on things that should be changed. Um, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Uh, but, you know, R6 is uh, a, a small but uh, powerful object-oriented system that is uh, not super widely used, we'll find out, but uh, is strongly depended upon uh, across many different packages. I think it was first created five or six years ago. Um, as opposed to say like S3, which is part of the base R system, R6 is actually a package. It's a, entirely written in uh, base R. I think it's about somewhere around 600 lines of code, which is a little surprising when you consider how much it's you know capable of doing. In fact, I think like half of the code is just around one function that isn't entirely necessary. Um, uh, you know, it's a a stable um, object-oriented system that is kind of a complete departure from the S3 that we discussed last time. Um, I think it's had a few, you know, incremental package updates over the last few years, but for the most part, the, the core of it has changed uh, very little over time. And sort of in its design, we're going to see uh, that that uh, solidness to the package design is you know, sort of independent of the package itself. Uh, that makes it'll make more sense. Um, but as you can see, it doesn't even depend on uh, anything other than R. It doesn't even depend on anything beyond, I think, like the utilities, uh, the utils namespace. So uh, really a, a tour de force uh, uh, sort of pure R package that has uh, a lot of sort of beautiful ideas in it uh, about how to accomplish its its uh, goal. So, you know, it, in comparison to S3, S3 was very much a uh, about generics and this class system and kind of delegation of, uh, delegation of responsibility. When you want to call a function on an object, uh, the S3 system will sort of look at the class inheritance structure of that object and try to figure out what uh, what method is going to operate on it. Um, the, the method is sort of divorced from uh, the function itself, but we'll see that R6 takes a kind of opposite perspective and it's all about encapsulation. It's all about tying methods to uh, the, the data itself. So that's one of its uh, big sort of differences from the S3 system. It's probably biggest comparison is with uh, what's called the reference class system, um, which is again base R and it's built up on the S4 object, uh, object oriented programming uh, system, which I think is next week's topic. Um, it's a little weird, we're kind of out of order. Uh, R6 definitely came out before S4 and, sorry, R6 came out after S4 and after uh, reference classes. But I think because of how uh, successful it was in its design and uh, some of its features, that uh, it kind of left the others in their dust. Um, so, where do we see R6? Okay, so uh, just have some code here to kind of uh, search through CRAN and uh, see packages that are either importing, depending, or suggesting the use of R6, and looks like a grand total of 317 packages on all CRAN are uh, using R6, which I, I guess I don't remember what the total number of packages are, but I want to say it's tens of thousands, 10,000 at least. Um, so, you know, not too many total packages out, actually out there are using it. To be fair, it's like I said, it's only about five years old. Um, but if we look at uh, sort of, you know, what are, what are some of those packages? Um, again, search through CRAN, sort them by uh, download rank, 
and we see dplyr, that's the top one, that's probably downloaded quite a bit, package build, that's used in the, I guess I don't know exactly what that's used for, but I know I've seen it and I know I have it. Uh, test that is quite common, uh, HETR, et cetera, et cetera, Roxygen 2, Shiny. Um, these are all packages that are used by many, 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 many other packages. So while there probably aren't that many packages that use R6 directly, there are a majority of them that depend in some way on, uh, on R6 sort of indirectly. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, how, what's, what are some examples of uh, some R6 objects? Uh, here, let's take a look at test that. So we're going to take test that, look at its namespace. There's a fun use of that E apply operator. We're going to uh, apply the is.r6 class uh, function to all the members of the namespace and pick out those that are R6. And we see you know, about 17 uh, different R6 classes are used in the test that uh, packages. Um, so what is that? Let's just pick the top one, stack. Fortunately for us, this is actually a pretty uh, simple to understand class. Um, test that stack returns, uh, well, it doesn't say anything about R6, but it's a stack object generator. Uh, we see it has some components, public, private, uh, and then a few other parameters. You know, if you've had exposure to object-oriented programming before, then the idea of public and private is probably familiar. Um, it's not exactly the same as probably other implementations of public and private that you might be familiar with, but it's it's similar. Um, and in spirit, it's it's similar. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So, like I said, uh, what was the, the goal that I think um, they were trying to address when creating the R6 package? Um, you know, at the time they had reference classes, uh, but I think part of the concern with reference classes were, were a little clunky built on S4. I've only had very minimal exposure to S4, so I can't really, you know, I have zero exposure to reference classes. Um, but uh, given what I've known about S4, I can imagine it's pretty clunky. Um, but uh, it wanted to uh, sort of get at those same kinds of uh, capabilities. Um, and one of those capabilities is this idea of encapsulation, right? Uh, when we talked about with S3, those methods, uh, the data and the methods were disjoint from one another. Um, really, you could give, you could make any object, any object could become any class you wanted it to. Uh, it's no guarantee that the methods are going to work properly with it, but, um, you know, that's the sort of the freewheeling niceness of, of S3 is that, uh, you know, you, you can make anything work with anything. If it, if you want. Um, R6 is very much the opposite. R6 is all about uh, sort of tying everything together into a, a nice little package um, that is, uh, at least from its interface uh, perspective, uh, not easily mutable, right? So not something that's easy to change once it's kind of uh, built. Um, We'll see that that's not entirely true, but um, that's the big idea. And right? so encapsulation, we want to have the data and the methods that are going to be using and manipulating that data um, tied together into a single object. And one of the ways that um, this is accomplished is through the concept of reference semantics. Okay, so reference semantics are something that, that we are somewhat already familiar with. Um, it's part of base R. Um, you know, the idea of reference semantics is, you know, most objects and the way you interact with them in, in R, uh, when you modify an object or uh, change it in some way, then 
then it creates a copy. Okay, uh, and when you pass, you know, when you pass uh, a value from a, the global environment and you pass it into a function that you're calling, and you do something uh, to that uh, to that value, like double. Say you passed in number two and you wanted to double it inside of a function. Well, that double value is is a new, a completely new object. You didn't you didn't change the thing you passed in. You you created a new object, uh, doubled it. So on the left hand, we can see this idea of value semantics. Now, this is kind of how we know it. I assign the value one uh, to name x, and then I'm going to assign x to y. So now I have y and x and you know, at least from the outside, they're both to be one. Uh, but then if I change X to two, you know, well, I hear them like, I, it's like, it looks like I'm saying, well, X is gonna be the same thing as Y. So if I change X to two, then Y should be two as well. That's not one, right? Because when we did this modification, R internally is kind of tracking all these different references um, and when I change the value of one of those references, then it kind of splits and creates a, a new object. And so, uh, in this sense, you know, this, this, at least probably to most people, and if you've been in R at all, this, this is a familiar and, uh, reasonable thing to happen, right? Uh, however, reference semantics, we do know reference semantics from, environments. Okay, so kind of similar idea if I create a new environment called X and then I assign that environment uh, also to Y. X and Y are both referring to this environment um, and then when I go into that X environment and add a new element A, assign it to number two, you know, well I've, I've in, in my value semantics mind I've changed X. And so, you know, I'm expecting Y to not, you know, basically not even have this object A to begin with because it wasn't there. I modified X. But environments have reference semantics. And so when I call Y dollar sign A, it's showing two also. Um, that environment is the same between these two bindings of the environment. Um, modifying it in using one name is does not do anything uh kind of it happens behind the scenes okay. so and we're going to see uh that this is pretty much the sort of the gist of what makes r6 r6 and a lot of the rest of it's kind of just building up a, an object-oriented system to behave like people are expecting uh, in a traditional uh, encapsulating object-oriented system, um, but really kind of the, the heart of it lies around this idea of reference semantics. So is this kind of where clone comes in if you wanted to create that your your mental model of like why should not be two? Yep, yeah, so, so uh, clone we'll see is, uh, you know, when I mentioned earlier, there's like one function that's about half the code. Uh, and that's clone. Um, yeah, that the, you know, it's not, it's not necessary, but if you wanted to uh, make new objects and not have this kind of behavior uh, where things are being shared between elements or between you know, variables, then yeah, that's, that's where clone is going to come in and some stuff about it. Okay, so, so how do we create uh, an R6 class. If you looked at the R6, you know, if you open up R, type R6 colon colon, see what methods are there, there's only three, right? It only exports three methods, and really you only need one of them. Uh, the one method that you're probably going to ever interact with in R6 is the R6 class method. And uh, the simplest way to create an R6 class is to just run the method. Don't pass any options, just run it and you have generated uh, an R6 class. Okay, so you see it comes pre uh, kind of populated with a couple different things. In particular, that clone uh, method exists in this, this sort of public list um, along with some of the other, the other parameters. Um, 
but that's about it. And in particular, you'll notice that it's uh, in the very first line of the output there, it shows unnamed object generator. You know, really what we've uh, produced, and, and this, I keep going back and forth on like, you know, what to call the class. You know, the, I think of this thing as a, a generator of classes. Um, but obviously in the way it's defined and the way all the sort of nomenclature works, this is the class itself. Um, and we'll see that we can create instances uh, of this class. So um, when you call class on our uh, beer class, which we've named beer, uh, then we see that the class assigned to it is an R6 class generator. Okay, so not an R6 class, it's an R6 class generator, but we still call it an R6 class. This is confusing. Um, now, about the, the name that we've assigned to it, uh, you know, it's pretty common, uh, I suppose, that the class name that you use when defining an R6 class matches, it's identical to the name that you're assigning that generator to. It's not necessary. Uh, you know, I could have assigned this to a lowercase beer uh, name if I wanted to. Um, really, this the that name uh, that we're passing in is uh, pretty much only used to define, uh, in some sense, the S3 class of what we're using, and it's part of the printing method when it when you print the object. So instead of saying unnamed, it's going to say beer object generator. Um, but there, there is no, you know, it, it, I know that from my perspective or when I was learning R6, that was a little confusing is that why am I, why do I have to do this kind of duplicating effort of naming it the thing that I'm assigning it to? Uh, but it turned out it's, it's one, the name's not necessary and two, uh, it doesn't have any connection at all to the object you're assigning the generator to. Okay, so what is this beer thing? Well, beer, this R6 class generator, is actually an environment. Okay, uh, so this, as we'll see, is how R6 is sort of injecting this reference semantics uh, into its nature, is that all an R6 class is, is an environment. Uh, it's an environment that uh, has bundled together um, other environments, functions, variables, uh, and just on being an environment, it, by virtue of being an environment, it has uh, reference semantics. Okay. So, uh, there's so not much Hello, I have a question. Yeah. So you remember how we learned copy on modify, like what Maya just asked a little while back for, um, you know, for other objects, but for functions, we had copy inline, correct? Or like, so is ref reference semantics, is that in any way similar to copy inline or is that like a different way of uh, uh, creating your environment? Uh, so I might have missed this discussion. Does anyone want to remind me what copy inline is referring to? Uh, otherwise, so, so the copy on modify is when you uh, when you change um, a value that you assign to an object, um, it creates a copy, but it doesn't actually uh, the object is not you don't get another instance of the object. And copy inline is you actually get a new uh, memory uh, assignment to um, I guess to the changed uh, object. So. I don't know, I guess I, I'm, maybe I'm mixing up several things, but I didn't know if there was anything similar or dissimilar between copy and line reference semantics. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that. I don't, uh, I guess, yeah, I'm not familiar with that concept and function. I, at least there's a difference. Uh, yeah. So you, are you saying like when, when you call a function, let's say I have function F and it has a single, formal argument x. Uh, if I define x as 2, um, let's use a different name, if I define a as 2, and I call f of a, 
then inside of my function, it's not A, it's X, right? It's, uh, and, you're, and that's the sort of inline thing you're talking about that we're assigning uh, the A value to X. Right, yes, uh-huh. So, but that becomes like the functional environment. Anyway, I, I feel like I'm going, maybe started up something I shouldn't have, but um, I, I can probably continue this in the Slack channel. So sorry okay. about that. No, no, no. no. Um, obviously, I, I like questions I don't know the answer to. Um, so I, I, I don't, yeah, I guess I don't necessarily know how that would show up other than there are methods in, uh, in R6 classes and so they would behave the same, uh, the same way. Um, I, now that I'm thinking about it a little, I think we might get to that, touch on that a little bit later. Um, the actual sort of innards of how, uh, these R6 classes are um, actually produced um, is somewhat complicated and I think is tied into what you're asking about. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll try to take a look at that at the end if we have time. Okay, so instantiating class, right? We have this class generator. How do I actually make an object? You know, how do I generate one of these things? Uh, well, the, the function or the method uh, of the class to generate and, and instantiate a new object is the new method. So every R6 class um, has a handful of methods that are sort of built into it. One of those is new. Um, so if I want to create uh, an actual uh, instance of this class, I would call uh, beer dollar sign new, uh, and that has uh, produced this beer object okay so you can see since we defined it as just the the object with a, a name it doesn't have too much to it in fact it's just the name uh this public and a and within whatever public is there is the clone okay and i don't even necessarily need to have the clone uh the r6 class uh, method has an argument clonable and i can set clonable equal false i you know whatever reason i don't want my object to be clonable, which there are sometimes you would, might want to do this. Uh, for one, the clone function is kind of large, and so it has a uh, memory footprint to it. So if you're making a lot of R6 objects and you know that you don't need a uh, clone, then that would, might be one, one reason why you would not want to have uh, a clone method attached to it. But you can set it to false, and then you can see, wow, we just have uh, beer, this beer class, and uh, public, and there's Nothing in it. I think it shouldn't have that bare colon. That's how the format procedure works. So obviously public's pretty important because if we strip out everything else, it's still there. Um, what is public? Okay, so the public is one of the arguments, uh, at least that's how we encounter it. It's one of the arguments in the R6 class method. And it takes a named list, and it has to be named. Uh, named list of either functions or uh, objects. I guess functions are objects. So it takes a named list of objects. Okay, uh, but internally it's going to it's going to split those out and it's going to identify those things that are uh, actual functions or closures and those things that are not. So um, internally, uh, what's kind of happening is uh, in this R6 class, uh, there is a nested uh, hierarchy of environments. And one of those environments is going to be called self, okay? Um, there's all kinds of sort of mind-numbing uh, connections between all the different objects. You kind of see that at the end. Um, but uh, for, for our perspective, self is kind of referring to the class itself. Um, and, and within self, you'll see, uh, you'll have uh, in that environment bindings for all of the public members. And what we'll see later on uh, are also active members. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, ways to access public uh, public elements of an R6 class. Well, if you're outside of the class itself, so if you're just working with, say, an instance of the class and you want to uh, 
inspect or probe um, one of those methods, then you can just reference it with a dollar sign. Okay, because right, because uh, beer itself is an environment, and that environment is self. You know, it inside. I swear, I wish I could go inside of R right now. I probably should do that. Inside of an R6 class is uh, a reference back to itself. Okay, um, so this beer environment has within it the self name, and that self name is a reference back to the environment that we're calling beer, okay? Um, and since we uh, define this class to have a public uh, met a public object called ABV of 5%, we can access it beer dollar sign ABV 5%, okay? Um, now from within the class, right, I'm going to access these public uh, public variables and public objects using the self name. Okay, so if I want to, I can't I'm gonna caveat this. I can't just say ABV, and it, it would know that. Oh, well, you know, I'm I'm in the I'm I'm within the environment right now. I should be able to identify what ABV is. Um, you know, I should be able to find it in my search path. Uh, you know. Uh, we we have to uh, we have to say look inside of self and then access the ABV number. Uh, so here we've defined a uh, percent ABV method, which is just going to output our ABV uh, format. Okay, and you'll notice this reference to self ABV. All right, so <clears throat> you know now that we've defined this object, uh, this class generator. And because, uh, as we'll see, building these classes, it kind of ends up taking up a lot of screen space and uh, it makes it very hard to give a presentation on R6 classes when your entire screen is just defining the object. Uh, is there a way that I can modify that uh, generator after I've already created it, right? So I have this beer uh, R6 class generator that I've defined with an ABV uh, uh, value in this, uh, what I call it now, what did I call it, uh, percent ABV function, what can I add more things to it? Well, let's try the, the naive solution. I'll just assign uh, beer rating of five, right? So I'm going to add a rating uh, variable to my beer class generator and, <clears throat> well, it didn't error, so that's good. Um, I wouldn't necessarily expect it to. I mean, it's just an environment. You can assign values to an environment almost always. Um, so that's easy. I'll just make a new object and access my rating variable. Oh, it's, it's null. Uh, so that didn't exactly work as I would have hoped. You know, uh, I'm assigning rating. I'm signing to within the beer environment, which is the same as that self environment, which has all of our public members. I'm assigning uh, the name rating to the value five. And if I make a, a new instance of that object and try to access it, well, and that new instance is referring back to that same class, uh, it's not there. Um, and this kind of, again, is gonna go back to the uh, sort of torture you have to go through understanding how uh, these R6 classes are actually uh, produced under the hood. It's not something that's necessarily difficult to digest if you have like an hour or two or 10 to sit down and kind of process step by step through everything, uh, but it, it's not easy enough to explain in the time that we have. <laughs> so. Uh, Fortunately, we do have uh, another uh, sort of uh, gratuitous method uh, provided to us, this set method. And set will allow us to modify a class object under a fairly broad set of circumstances after it's already been produced. Okay, so I can call beer dollar sign set. Uh, the first parameter, we're going to specify what sort of access environment do we want to go to. So right now we only know about public, so I'm going to um, 
I want to set a new uh, object in the public environment. I want to call it rating, pass as a character, and the third parameter is a value. We're going to assign it to five. Okay, so if I do, if I set the beer class and assign a rating of five, and try the same thing again, and it works, right? Um, in, inside set procedure is basically setting everything up so that when the class is instantiated, it knows that this rating thing needs to be kind of carried along as part of the class definition. Okay, so we're gonna be using this set procedure um, pretty much throughout the rest of the, uh, the talk. Um, you know, it's something that I, and when I've used R6 in some of my own scripts and packages before, um, I might want to split up like the definition of my R6 class using the set procedure rather than having some sort of monolithic class definition. Um, if you look at some of the, uh, some R6 classes, you know, you're, you're passing everything as function arguments. So it's really uh, kind of limiting in terms of how you're structuring things and kind of how you want to comment it and format it. Um, sometimes it's helpful that you can make these changes sort of after the fact. Okay, so <clears throat> what would a, an object-oriented class system be if it didn't have uh, inheritance? And uh, R6 is certainly object-oriented and it does offer uh, inheritance. One of the parameters to the R6 class uh, method is inherit, and inherit is expecting a name, okay? Um, it's expecting a name which will, when it's instantiated, evaluate to another R6 class, okay? Or, when I say class, I mean a class, one of these class generators. Um, so when I say inherit equals beer, you know, uh, I'm saying I want this class to inherit from the beer class. And then inherit in this sense is kind of doing exactly what you would think uh, from any other sort of object-oriented system is it's going to um, inherit all of its public methods, all of its public variables, all of its private methods and private variables, and everything that I'm not basically overriding with my own method. Okay, it's gonna it's gonna behave exactly the same except where I don't want it to. Um, but it's important to know that when we're passing in inherit equals beer, that internally right now when I uh, define this IPA, uh, you know, class generator, it has done nothing with the beer class that uh, that we've defined so far. It just knows that hey, when I when when uh, I'm going to instantiate this class. I need to look for an R6 class generator called beer. Um, this has some some sort of profound effects down the line that uh, help with portability of classes. And one of the, the sort of the big benefits of R6 is that you can inherit from classes and in other packages, um, and not necessarily have to depend on those packages. Okay. So I'm going to define this uh, IPA class, right? And that's, uh, seems like something reasonable to inherit from a class called beer. Um, and when I create it, call it IPA, uh, instantiate my object, I see IPA inherits from beer. And it has all the same, uh, same elements from the beer class that we had already produced, right? It's got the ABV and percent ABV and rating. Um, I want to say that the clone also comes from the beer class, but I'm not positive on that. Probably doesn't really have a, doesn't matter in the end, but uh, it could. Um, but basically it's, it's accepted, it's inherited all of its uh, classness from the beer class. And we've given it nothing other than a new name. Okay. So, uh, Hadley has a section in the chapter called introspection. Um, this is probably some, some uh, computer science-y term that I'm not too familiar with. Um, but 
uh, the idea is, you know, and I mentioned this earlier, when we when we pass in that class name parameter to the R6 class parameter, um, it's really only using it to uh, assign an S3 class, you know, a class attribute uh, to this uh, environment that we're producing. Um, so here I'm gonna I'm going to uh, create a new class, double IPA, which is going to inherit from IPA, which inherited from beer, and uh, instantiate that and look at what the, the class attribute of my uh, double IPA instance looks like. And I can see, well, it's uh, double IPA, IPA, beer, and then R6. And so it, it has, uh, in a sense, it, it's, it's gained, um, that sort of S3 inheritance behavior um, purely from the names of the R6 classes. Um, now, one thing I'm curious about, so I, I've never tested it before, but if I had a class, R6 class that didn't have a name, I'm assuming that it just wouldn't show up in the uh, class listing, like it wouldn't show up in the uh, empty quotes or anything like that. But. Uh. So I have a question. Yeah. You remember that first object you created and yep. you ran a class on it? What was yep. the class called again? Uh, first class was beer and, well, so here yeah. we, we did class, we did uh, the class on the R6 class generator object and it was beer. And I don't think I actually ever called Wait. class on the beer instance. If I did, it would it would just say beer and then R6. Okay, so wait, so what was the difference in the call that got R6 class generator? So the R6 class generator is the output, um, is the object that's produced when you call R6 class, okay? The R6 class produces this generator object, and then the generator is used to produce these. The actual instance. The instance, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like we're, we're defining, yeah. And this yeah. is where, like I said, it does get confusing because I think in all the, you know, sort of documentation and everything, they kind of refer to both as being the class, which again, deep down, they kind of are, um, but, uh, yeah, the, the object coming out is a generator and it generates these R6. Okay. So it's like a, it's like one, like a, a template and then the, the other is the instantiation of the template, like the actual instance of it. That, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So I'm trying to remember back to like Java, like in Java or wherever you define a class, uh, you instantiate it in a new class, right? You to assign it to something. Uh, so that's the same kind of idea here. We have this class template or class generator and we call new and we get an instance of that class. Maybe that was C++, I forget. It's been a while since I've oh, anything but R. <laughs> so Tyler, I have a question. Yeah. So when you do the double IPA or IPA, like after you create the class object generator, you don't need to do new anymore uh, since, I mean, if you're instantiating at that point, but you don't need to um, use new at that point. Is that, is, am I getting that right? Right. In fact, uh, there is no new method in that uh, DIPA object. Um, the, that, that object contains uh, all of the public members that we've defined, basically everything when we printed the object, uh, it has an ABV uh, name, clone, percent ABV rating, and a few other uh, things that aren't being printed here. Um, but uh, that object is an instance. If you wanted to create a new, a new um, double IPA, then you would call double IPA dollar sign new again, and that would create a new object. Um, distinct from the one that we have uh, currently. So anytime you want to make this up, so be, you know, I don't know how much, like whenever you, if you want to make a new environment, right, it's not, it's not enough just to say new environment once and then, 
if you yeah. if you just use that object again and again, it's going to be because of reference semantics. It's going to be the same same object. It's never going to uh, kind of split itself. Got it. Thank you. Um, now it's not required that you give your uh, R six uh, class a class. You can pass in class equals false. And uh, when you instantiate your object and call class on it, it's just going to come back as an environment, uh, which is just uh, it's not actually a class attribute. It's just the, going back to the type of the object. When I first started these slides, I was trying to think, why on earth would you ever want to do that? Like, what, what harm does it have? Um, but it turns out that there is you know, a potential performance gain if it doesn't have uh, a class attribute assigned to it. it can, uh, kind of bypass some of the S3 behavior because um, it's just not, it doesn't treat it like an S3 class. So there is some some benefit to doing that. In fact, I think that in test that, I think the, the stack class, uh, the instances of the stack class are classless, probably for that reason. Okay, so we have public. Um, you know, there's also uh, another sort of access method. You know, if we want to uh, kind of separate the public interface, right? And that's why it's called public. It's 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 what the user is able to interact with and see. Um, you know, sometimes I might want to have some of the some of the dirty uh, sort of complexity behind the class hidden from the user, so they they don't need to know what's happening under the hood. Um, but internally, I still kind of want to have that. I want to have it encapsulated within the class. Uh, you know, I could have that complexity just assigned to some function that exists in my package somewhere. Um, but in most cases, I, I would like to have that complexity, in, you know, encapsulated inside the class itself. And in those cases, uh, you would use the private argument to define private members. Okay, private members are something that you cannot access uh, externally. You can only access private members internally, and you access them with uh, the private name. Okay, so when you say private, uh, when you call you know the private fun private value variable inside of one of these uh, methods, um, it's going into the self environment, and it has a Inside that sort of nested hierarchy, there is a reference to this private environment. Um, and so we can access the private members using the private name. And any members that I assign to the private uh, environment is, are going to be, you know, ostensibly only accessible uh, from within the class itself and within methods in the class. That's not entirely true. Um, you can work a little bit harder by like, like a very minimal amount. Um, Adley said it was more significant than it actually is. Uh, but if you wanted to see what the private members are of a class, they'd say you weren't the owner of, like you wanted to um, look at a, a shiny R6 class, that you, like you didn't create that. You're not able to modify any of the functions necessarily. Then uh, how can you inspect it? Well, inside of uh, your in instance of an artist class, there is this enclose in uh, name, which is referring to the, the enclosing environment of uh, the class, which contains, again, self and uh, private and all those other things. So. A third uh, access method is active. Okay, this is actually really cool. Um, it's definitely, I think, something that uh, it takes a little bit to get used to kind of what's happening. We've seen it before. I think we talked about this when we, either the environments chapter or one of the chapter six or so. Um, the active, uh, environment within an R6 class makes active bindings. Okay, active bindings are also called lazy or delayed bindings, which is super confusing because I think those are antonyms of one another. Um, 
active and lazy are. Uh, but they, they kind of behave the same way. So active, uh, active bindings kind of have really specific behavior uh, and the behavior depends on how you define them. Okay, so an active binding is going to take a function and bind it to a name. And then it allows you to call, when you try to access that name, it will evaluate the function. So it allows you to use a function uh, kind of like a variable, okay? And so if you define your function that has, and it has no variables, no inputs, then uh, it is going to treat it like a variable, okay? So um, that's what that means. If I, if I give it one variable, then it's gonna be treated like an assignment, okay? So I could define a, uh, a function which takes in one variable, and if I pass in no variables, I can have it behave uh, like a variable. I'm using variable like repeatedly here, but I can pass in nothing and get back a value. Or I could pass in a, uh, a value and the class will sort of behave like an assignment operator and it's going to mutate something in my class. And if I have two variables, you, no, you can't have two variables. Um, so what does this look like? Okay, If I go into my beer class and define uh, a member of the active uh, environment called name, in the one variable case, I should have said this, yeah, kind of, <laughs> can't change the name. Zero variable case. Uh, you know, this function is just going to return uh, a the private name member okay, that we produced earlier. So um, really, this is kind of this is allowing me to have somewhat of a public interface to that private uh, object that, that exists in our class. Okay, so I instantiate my uh, beer class, get a new beer, and if I access it dollar sign name, you know, it, dollar sign name is a, is a function in the beer environment, but because of it being a, a, this active binding, it is actually going to evaluate the function. And what it returns is the private name member. Okay, but if I try to assign a new name, right, to that active member, I get an error, right? Um, I get an error because my function doesn't have any arguments. If I instead defined an argument like I did on the right-hand side, this is the one variable case, um, then, you know, I can use this active, uh, active binding to either behave like a, a variable or allows me to do something like assignment. Um, so in this case, you know, I've defined the name variable in the active environment to first check if was was a a variable provided. And by the way, the only way you're you're providing a variable to this active binding is by assignment. Okay, so we see that on the bottom. We're going to assign duff light, and basically internally R is going to treat duff light as the uh, the thing that's being passed into this active binding function. But if I don't pass anything in, like I do on the bottom, right, and I just call the function uh, and that argument's missing, then I'm going to return that private name object. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to check and make sure that the name being passed in, uh, you know, sort of is an object that I would want to be a name for my class. So I'm just checking, you know, doing, uh, validation of the data before assigning it to our private name element. Okay, so that, that's a common use case for these active functions, active bindings, is to kind of do this uh, parameter validation um, and sort of a, acting as a go-between between private members and public interface. Uh, Tyler? Yep. Can, you, can you have private functions within a class in addition to the yep. private? Uh, so can you change the nature of a private function by using an active binding? Only in the sense that if it depends on other private uh, 
uh, well, if you know, if it depends on other private variables and you change it, then it'll, that'll change behavior. But you mean like, can I reassign uh, the private function to a new function? Yeah. So like, can you, um, I guess like overriding or, or I forgot what it's called in classic uh, uh, oops terms, but yeah. Can no, you I don't, I okay. don't believe when, when, when the, when the object is instantiated, it, uh, I'm pretty sure by default locks the environments. Um, but by locking me, it, it, it doesn't allow you to, um, add, it doesn't allow you to add any new names. And I think they make it so that you can't modify any of the bindings. Well, you know, we might take a look at that. That's a good question to ask. I don't think so. Okay, so, you know, uh, another common function that you're gonna see in uh, R6 classes is the initialize function. Okay, so initialize is a method that's called at the end of the generator's new method. So after this generator has gone through all the work of constructing this sort of nested hierarchy of environments, um, it's gonna call whatever initialize function, if any, has been provided uh, when you define the class generator. Um, so this is a, a, a good place to allow a user to sort of customize the, the, the instance that it's creating. So if you wanted to set one of those private or public variables based on an argument, um, usually that would be done through the initialize method. Um, and there's a couple other uh, use cases we'll see. So in this case, uh, I'm gonna have an initialize method. This is gonna be you know, something that's called at the, at the end of the, anytime we call new, and it's going to be expecting at least a name and possibly a rating. The rating value is gonna be defaulted to five. You'll see in each of those cases, we're assigning um, the passed in name and rating to uh, the names that we've already defined in our public, uh, in our public uh, namespace called namespace, that's already a thing, public environment, okay, that, we're, that we see in the self. So we assign the self name, the name that's passed in, and the self rating, the rating that's passed in, and then we give a little message to verify that we're doing what we think it's doing. Okay, so I create this new breakfast stout and uh, this new beer object that I've created uh, has, uh, has a name, breakfast stout, a rating, of five, that's good. One thing I just made to point out, and I'm really running out of time, but um, you know, as we've been going through this and creating new objects, you know, like making changes using set to kind of add new capabilities to our beer class, um, those new abilities do not exist in the objects we've created earlier. If I went, if I went back to the that double IPA, the DIPA object. That inherited from beer that we would you know expect to have all the sort of beer things with it. Um, it only has the sort of characteristics of the beer class that existed when we instantiated um, that class. When we called uh, you know double IPA dollar sign new, um, that kind of fixed everything and fixed its sort of connection to the double IPA and to the beer class at that point. Um, so none of these things that we've done so far would be present in, in that object, which is important to kind of remember as you go, go through that and changing the class generator doesn't alter any of the instances that you generated before that. Okay, um, in, the, you know, in the case of inheritance, uh, sometimes you might want to do a special initialization inside of uh, inside of a class and then, you know, pass on some of the parameters uh, back to one of the, one of the parent classes, the super classes, um, and initialize, you know, call the initialize method in that environment. Um, it doesn't happen by default. If you did, if you're in a, if you're in a inherited class and you didn't define an initialize, 
uh, method, but the parent had defined an initialized method, then it would use it by default. But if you create an initialized method within your subclass, then you need to explicitly call um, the initialize of your parent class if you want to use it. Okay, so here we're defining a special initialize for the IPA class, which is just going to randomize the case of the uh, name that we pass in. Okay, another uh, use case for initialize is, and then a thing kind of to be aware of is if any of your public uh, or private methods or objects uh, use reference semantics, so like if they are an R, another R6 class or an environment or a data table is another thing to use reference semantics, um, then you probably want to make sure that you're actually um, creating those objects inside of the initialize function. Okay, um, because as we see here in this self counter case, you know, I'm defining in the public environment this count in and it has, it's just producing a new environment. And then my initialize function, I'm going to modify uh, the counter uh, object within that environment and increment it. Okay. And because I defined that count in outside of the initialize, it's just you know, part of the uh, class generation itself, then that object, that new end that I'm seeing there is going to be uh, part of every, um, every new instance of this class. And so they're all going to share the same environment. So in some cases that's useful. In this case, when I'm defining a, you know, I, I might want to have something to keep track of how many instances of a class have I created. Well, that would be a case where you might want to do this. And you can have this kind of shared environment between um, all the different objects. Um, Tyler, why is it that a data table um, uses reference semantics? Uh, in internally, uh, they've it's 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 how it stores the its data structure. You know, it, it masquerades as a data frame, but um, sort of you know behind the scenes, and kind of what gives it all of its speed is that it has this, this reference semantics. And it's it's not because it's an environment. Um, it's something different entirely, but it's, it's, it's how it's programmed. And that's pretty different from a data frame in the way it's structured? Uh, yes, but you know, yes, I, you know, I put that in there. I didn't actually test it out. I think it should be the case because I, you know, I, this is something that you might find, like if you pass in a data table into a function and then you say, uh, if you've used data table before, you use colon equals to define a new column. That will actually modify the object in, you know, the in the original place where you call the function from. It doesn't uh, do that sort of inline uh, copying that, that that you mentioned earlier. I forget who mentioned that earlier, but. Um, yeah. So instead, if I define the, if I initialize that environment uh, within the initialized function, then every time I instantiate this class, it's going to get an entirely new count env and uh, be pretty useless for what we want it to do. Um, it is, I guess, worth calling out. You see that I still have to define count env equals null. Um, outside of the initialized class. Uh, again, once it gets the initialized, the structure of the class has been set and all of the uh, environments have had their bindings locked. So you can't create a new binding within these in public, private, uh, active environments after the fact. Not easily, anyway. Um, not without some mucking around in the R code. Uh, but um, so that that's something to keep in mind. So if you want to use, if you want to define a public member inside of the initialized function, it needs to already, you know, the name needs to exist in that uh, environment already. Okay, in addition to initialize, there's finalize. Uh, finalize is kind of used as a cleanup procedure. Um, so 
you know, anytime uh, you uh, use one of these R6 classes and, and you've removed, let's say you, you think you're done with it, you remove the object, uh, eventually the garbage collector is going to come by and it's going to try to, you know, get that memory back. And uh, the finalized method is going to work similar to the on exit uh, function, which I think we had seen that few chapters ago. Uh, it's basically, it's, it's going to, it's a defining a method that's going to be called when the object is garbage collected. Um, and so here we can see that we're, we're going to define uh, a finalized method in our class. It just says good night brew. And when we remove it, nothing necessarily happens. We can force a garbage collection to happen. And when we do that, uh, we'll see that it uh, outputs our message because the finalized function will be called. Print is another sort of common method to see defined for an R6 class. You don't have to. You can use R6's sort of default print method. Um, I have it sort of printed out there on the left, but it will look for a print method in your public uh, in in your public environment, and um, if it exists, it'll call that instead. Um, it's worth pointing out again that uh, if you do define a variable called print, it has to be in public. I think inside of the R6 internals, it will it checks if you try to define print in a, in the private um, section, and it will say you can't do that. Uh, so just to know, it has to be a public uh, member. Are there any uh, other functions that have to be? Is it just print or? No, yeah, initialize, finalize, print. Is it like a summary or I don't know? I don't think there is. I think maybe format, which I had on the other on there as well. I think format might have to be uh, public. Um, not positive. If you if you if you were to like uh, create an R six class generator and look at the new method, you can go through the code and it's pretty early on. It, uh, it checks to to see if you did that or not. Um, okay, so cloning, right? Because of reference semantics, we have, uh, you know, we have a need to uh, make copies of objects, but you know, not necessarily carry these connections between them, like we saw um, with that uh, the counter in, right? All the different instances shared that same reference, uh, and with our six objects, the same kind of thing can happen. Um, it, you don't you don't get that kind of value semantic breaking of you know producing a copy of the object whenever you change something. Um, so R6 classes have a clone method, which will uh, basically produce copies of all of the objects uh, sort of defined within it. There is an option uh, to pass deep equals true. And when you pass deep equals true, it's going to try and make copies of all of those objects inside of it that also have uh, reference semantics. And then you'll go inside of each of those objects and uh, make these copies, do a deep, deep copy of it. Now as a kind of winding down example, uh, you know, let's define and modify our, our beer class, we're going to assign to it a, a new private variable called uh, dot bottles. Again, the, you know, usually see dot in front of private members just because like this is something that is kind of hidden and that's a common R thing to do to name variables you don't want sort of visible, but dots, you don't have to. Um, that's a pretty common thing to see. So we call it dot bottles and it's going to default to nine. Uh, then we're going to add an active name, bottles, and it's going to be that public interface to our private dot bottles. Um, and if we don't pass in a value, it's going to return the private variable. Otherwise, it's going to assign it to that private variable. It doesn't do any checks. Um, and then we're going to define a new function, drink, which will, as you can read, 
play the usual drinking game. Um, and so we can see if I uh, instantiate my beer class Duff, it's going to call that that uh, initialized method that I already had. And every time I call drink, it's going to look at uh, how many bottles of Duff we have, and then take one down and decrement it, right? Subtract one from the bottles. And eight, seven, six, five, four, I'd sing the whole thing, but we've been here forever. Ah, no more beer on the wall, okay? Now I can keep going, I keep going, but it's just gonna keep telling me I had no more bottles and that's pretty sad. Uh, another method I could have done this, and this is sort of a, a neat feature of R6, uh, is you know if you have an active method or a public method that uh, returns self, particularly returns self invisibly, then you can chain commands together. You know we've kind of been doing this already. Anytime I called beer dollar sign new dollar sign something else, that's method chain um, because new returns self invisibly and drink as we had defined it returns self invisibly. So I can just chain uh, a bunch of drink commands together and each time I do it, it's going to call drink function, decrement my number of bottles and uh, just work. Okay. Hey Tyler. Yes. When you use self, how is it that you didn't say dot bottles? Like you just reference bottles uh, directly. So is it not necessary when you use self? Because uh, we've defined that active binding. So the active bindings are sort of, it, it makes this lazy binding kind of in the public environment. You know, we, we treat it separately. We define it. Oh, got just, it. It's okay. just telling, it's, it's telling R6 how I want it to treat this specially. Um, but yeah, you would access active elements internally uh, using self all the same. So yeah, when I say self bottles and assign to that self bottles minus one, you know, it's going to, it's going on the right hand side, it's going to, uh, it's calling that active binding with no arguments. And so it returns whatever the current value is. We subtract one. And then here we're calling self bottles with the, the arrow assignment. And uh, that is calling it the active binding with uh, one argument. And so it is going to uh, do the assignment rather than returning the variable. Okay. Now, the last, uh, and I was hoping to have all kinds of like fancy diagrams showing you the super complicated structure of what things look like inside of R6 classes. Uh, instead, I'm just going to reference you to a RPUBS uh, post that was made, I don't know, five years ago, just about, um, that has a lot of these kind of diagrams. And you, can, you can kind of see how messy it is, but it's, it's, it's worth looking at uh, if you do kind of want to get to know what's happening internally inside of these R6 classes. And with that, we're running out of time, but if anybody wants to ask any questions. I don't think I caught enough of your presentation to ask intelligent ones, but uh, I will definitely catch up and be tagging you in the Slack. Okay. Yeah. You know, when I, when I put this all together, I was thinking, oh, this is not going to take too long at all. But uh, sure enough, there, it, there is a lot of complexity uh, sort of in that 600 lines of code that uh, Winston wrote producing this package. Um, but fortunately, you know, I think what Hadley covers in the chapter is sufficient to do a lot of the, uh, give you a lot of the basic understanding necessary. Like, you know, like you're seeing, it's not a commonly used package. So it's not like you're going to be interacting with it a ton, but if you do need to interact with it, it's kind of good to understand uh, roughly what are you looking at. Even though it's not super common, uh, or commonly used. I think every time I've seen it, it like makes a ton of sense where it's used, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, because again, if, if you, 
yeah, if you have any kind of programming background, you would sort of you're naturally inclined to use this encapsulated uh, kind of object oriented system. You know, the S3 system is not natural to, to a lot of people. Though I think Hadley says uh, avoid that urge because R6 code is, he calls it, you know, it's non uh, idiomatic R, R code. Um, but so what? Uh, it's, it's still, a, it's a very useful package and you know it definitely has its place and it, there are obviously use cases where it's you you want that kind of reference semantic you want to have that close uh, connection of data and method so it's it's it would be used I, s3 kind of feels a lot more like base r or like the r packages that are getting used i guess and r6 kind of is like very object oriented programming right. That's sort of a differentiation there. Yeah, and I think a lot of times, like you're, you're, you know, the R6 classes either are being used sort of under the hood, and so you, you know, it's just it's an internal, uh, non-exported uh, object of a package, and it's something that that they're using to uh, kind of make things easier for them, or uh, sometimes it's, you know, it's, in, it's entirely out there. Like the, the progress package is a good example of a, um, probably a, a case where you would encounter an R6 object that you actually needed to instantiate yourself and use the new, uh, new procedure and work with the R6 object. But, but a lot of them like shiny, uh, you know, you're not using the R6 objects really at all. Um, those are all internal. Same with dplyr. Um, I like I like the knowing that you know it's all based off environments, right? Like I always thought when I was first looking at environments that that itself was really, I mean, like an unstructured object-oriented kind of framework, uh, and then this feels like a structured uh, object-oriented framework. Um, yeah, and you know, like you know. Like I mentioned, the, the nice thing that they did with this, and when, when you go into uh, what's actually happening in, the, in, in R6, um, I definitely encourage everyone to actually just go look at the code for it. You don't have to read everything. Don't read the clone function, Barry. Um, but everything else is actually pretty comprehensible, and it's really neat how they, how they uh, use environments to uh, kind of create these objects and build something that is created from the package but has no dependencies on the package itself. Um, so uh, basically like it, it creates, an in, there is a, this, it's called a capsule environment um, that, uh, that is the parent environment of these uh, objects. And it has all of the functions that are used to make the object. And so when you, uh, when you have an R6 class in your uh, package, let's say, um, it doesn't actually have any necessary dependencies on R6. Within that object, it has encapsulated everything it needs to exist, and it has no direct references back to R6. Um, oh, okay. okay. And package. It, Sorry. So, so what you mean is that like you can just copy paste that code into some other thing without using, without attaching R six. Mm. Am I understand what you're saying correctly? No, no. Uh, I'm saying the the object within the package could be, uh, you know, reproduced oh, without right. R six being attached. Okay. So it's self. Okay. Yeah, so like it, it, it serializes the the environment inside of the, the package binary, let's say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and so there, you know, there is there is some benefit to doing this. Like if they do end up making changes to R six, uh, then a package that was written five years ago using a five year old version of R six uh, won't break 
because there's a new version of R6 out there that you know maybe changed the functionality because it captured all of the functions it needed to do what it needs to do uh, inside of itself when it was created. Um, and it doesn't care that there's a new uh, a new R6 out there and things have changed with how it works. That could be a bad thing too. I mean, if they make improvements, your old package is not going to, you know, directly benefit from those unless you rebuild the package. So are you saying that R6, like if you build a package with R6, it doesn't import R6? I think I got lost there. I think you do. You you import. I don't know exactly how it works. So you do usually, I mean, you put it in the uh, imports, um, you know, in your definitions file, but I think that's only in terms of like, it's needed to build the, build the package. And once the package is built, it no longer um, has that dependency. I think. Kind of speaking uh, from an uncomfortable spot here, but um, I think that's how that's how it works. I'll just say, you know, let's uh, take a look real fast. All right, you guys see R here? Yeah. I see you. Yeah. Okay. So if I look at say, uh, look at the observable class in, in Shiny. Okay, then all right, what is insight, right? This is an environment so I can list all of its elements. This is everything that's in that observable class. We can see uh, a link to or in the active name, we can see self, we can see that set method, a few other things, uh, other parameters that we didn't talk about. Um, but those are all uh, sort of part of that class. And right, these are all the things that are accessible. Same thing as I can see when I do dollar sign there, I can see all the same objects. Um, but if I look at the uh, parent environment of Shiny Observable, then it shows up as this R6 capsule, okay? Uh, which is the same, uh, if I look at a different R6 uh, class, it's the same capsule. Right, because this, this capsule was produced when this package was created. Um, but if I go to a different, if I go to test that and look at the stack uh, class and test that and look at his parent environment, I'm going to see also an R6 capsule, um, but it's the R6 capsule that was produced when this package was created. Uh, and so inside of this environment, we see a bunch of functions. We see uh, this all named, assign func ins, create super in, get super class. These are all these are all functions that are used um, by, uh, say for example, the new method um, when instantiation happens. These are functions that if you look at the uh, if you look at the R6 GitHub repo um, are part of the package, right? So like this create super in, this is part of R6, but I don't see it anywhere, right? If I'm looking I'm triple, triple colon off R6, where the hell is that create super in and get functions coming from? Well, it's part of this, this capsule environment, okay? So there is a capsule environment that is part of R6. And whenever you uh, create a uh, this new class, it's kind of carrying that capsule environment with it. 
in a sense. It's like I said, this, this is where you have to go, you know, look at that, that RPUBS article and kind of try to trace the, the manipulation that happens. There's lots of um, functions where the enclosing environment is changed and the uh, defining environment is changed after the object is created to kind of um, manipulate all these objects uh, to get into this kind of self-contained structure. So is that R6 capsule like the object generator, Tyler? Like the template that Darren said? Uh, no, no. It really it just it just contains a lot of um, like utility functions that uh, the class needs. Um, So I have a question. So the capsule is the parent to all the others yep. and its parent is the global, I guess? Uh, no. So, well, so, well, when, when we define the R6, it showed what the parent will. So, yeah. so the parent, the parent environment of the capsule is the R6 namespace. I okay. guess that's where, that's where it comes in. Okay. So, so if I use a name in a R6 method, it's going to search through that path uh, from whatever environment to the capsule to the R6 namespace, et cetera. Mm, no, let's, let's see. So let's, uh, let's make an so, object. <laughs> like, if, like if we didn't use self, for instance, right? Like if, if you had just used like some name, yeah. would it just, Search so through that path, like typically. Okay, so let's let's uh, I've instantiated this stack object. Uh, let's debug the push method and push an object on. And so we're inside of the stack instance now, right? But in particular, I'm inside of the uh, yeah. inside of the well, something like closing yeah. environment. Mm -hmm. Closing environment, but what's my parent environment? Oh, it's it's an environment that has private and self. So I can oh what well what's in you know what's in self? Well, self has links to all those things that we saw when we uh, instantiate this this object. It has the as list method clone initialize push and size and all that stuff um no, but like my my question is if you use a name that's not bound to anything in a method is there any check to like stop you going through up to the parent to the, to its parent etc cetera, etc cetera? uh no but like from within here as you can see um you know, the parent environment of self is the empty environment. Okay. Um, the parent environment of, oops. My environment was the one that had self and private and the parent environment of that is test that because uh, the class was created okay. in yeah. test that. And it'll go from, you know, it'll keep going through the search path from there. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, it really is kind of confusing when you get in there, but just initially and for a few hours or days or weeks after, but you play around with it, um, you can kind of get a better comprehension of what's happening under the hood. But from you know, from your kind of perspective, it is sort of its own environment. You can access members of the class using self and private, um, and you don't have to worry about sort of getting collision with other named objects that you might have created somewhere else. Okay. Right. 
Any other uh, questions or it's pretty late. Uh, this is definitely uh, an interesting topic and something that I, said, I encourage everyone to kind of take a look at the code. Um, but feel free to ask questions in the in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. Showing up. Take it easy.